Good morning, First Baptist Church. Isn't it a beautiful winter morning out there? Sun shining and just chilly and cold and just a beautiful day. Thank you for taking your time this day to be here to worship our Lord together with us. I want to remind you to take the little black pad that's there in the pew and pass it down to those in your row. If you'd sign and register your presence with us. Thank you for being here. And for those who are watching online, thank you for being a participant in this worship also. Our friend of the week is Betty Johnson. As always, we'd encourage you to be an encouragement to her this week. Tonight, we, well, let me ask it this way. If you are feeling the grief of the loss of a loved one, if that's your experience right now, we invite you tonight at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall to uh, our grief share session entitled Surviving the Holidays. If you find yourself looking at the holidays that lie ahead, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and just kind of dreading it, and wondering what it's going to be like because the one you love is not going to be there. Come, let this, let this speak to you. I think you'll find it a help as you deal with dealing with the holidays. Operation Christmas Child, the, the shoe boxes that go all over the world. Uh, today is the day for collecting of those boxes. If you have yours, bring it today. Set it out in the, in the narthex or out in the gathering area, and we'll be glad to take care of that and get it to the right place. If you didn't bring it this morning, you can bring it this evening. And we're just thankful for all who are participating in the Operation Christmas Child. Also, next Sunday evening, 5.30, is our harvest dinner when we uh, gather for Thanksgiving and fellowship together. And we invite all of you to come and be a part of that next, next Sunday at 5.30, not tonight, now a week away. And uh, the Wirtz family, we want to thank them for all their preparations for that. If you'll read the details in the bulletin, it talks about what each of us can bring to contribute to the food for that dinner. So next week, come be a part of that. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. The Lord is our everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Our everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. In our hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. Let's rise together and praise him. doxology together this morning. Good morning. 
For those who don't know me, my name is Darren White. I serve here at the church on the Board of Deacons as the chairman. And it's my privilege this morning to lead you in the offertory prayer. But before I do that, I just want to draw your attention to the bulletin, uh, kind of where the financial information is. If you'll note there, we're a 102% church. So just a testament to your faithfulness and giving, and we certainly appreciate that. I uh, want to recognize that we got about six or seven weeks left in the calendar year. And certainly want to encourage all of us to continue with that faithfulness uh, in giving. So, if you would, join me in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, we're thankful. We're thankful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for the folks gathered here today to worship you. We ask your blessings on their offering and for its use, and will not fail to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Feeling completely unworthy to mention his name. And for every soul that's been shattered by choices you've made, the Father still hears every prayer that a broken heart prays. Just when you thought you could somehow outrun it, you chase down by mercy. He proves there's nothing that his blood can cover, and his arms can reach to redeem. Oh, just when you thought you've exhausted his kindness, his gentle compassion pulls you out of hiding just when you thought that his grace somehow reached the end you find your forgiven again and it's so amazing how he will To reach through the darkness, the shame, the heartache, the hurt. And we find out again that there's nothing the Savior loves more than seeing surrender so He can renew and restore. Somehow outrun him, you chase down by mercy as he proves there's nothing that his blood can't cover and his arms can't reach to redeem. Oh, just when you thought you've exhausted his kindness, his gentle compassion pulls you out of hiding. Just when you thought that his grace somehow reached the end, you find you're forgiven again. He wants you never to far, and he'll meet you right where you are. Don't be afraid. Don't turn.
Thank you. Good morning. Let's greet one another. Stand, please. Well, good morning. Good to have you out tonight, or this morning. Tonight, it'll be good to have you out tonight. And it's good to have those who are tuning in uh, with us also on our live streaming. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. As you're turning there, this morning, my wife looked at me and she said, Wow, your beard is really gray this year. Now, I don't think it's that gray. I mean, obviously, you guys have put a few gray hairs in it. I'm just kidding, not you guys. Uh, I think it's just to do uh, with um, the years. But um, the reason I have this beard and the reason a lot of people are unshaved uh, through, this, uh, through this time of the year is we do something here called No Shave November. We have a lot of fun with it. Uh, there's some kind of a, a voting thing that's going on, too, where you can put a, a shaving cream pie in the face of one of the pastors or all of us. Uh, at the harvest dinner and so a lot of fun we're having with it but there's a very serious component to no shave november and that's to send kids to camp amen that's worth it boy sending kids to camp last year we were able to send so many kids to camp giving some full scholarships giving some partial scholarships to all of them who went and i really want to encourage you you, you don't have to grow a beard to be a part of it uh, you can just uh, be you can just say hey i'm interested in helping send kids to camp well the way you do that is after the services they will be uh, set up out in the uh, up, up across from the welcome center here and i think maybe out here as well they were going to do that and uh, you can just go by and, and give a donation for that. All of that money goes towards helping send kids to summer camp where they hear about Jesus Christ. How many 
people, how many kids come to Christ and make lifelong decisions while at camp, removing all of the things that they have in their ears and their, and their, their eyes in front of them all through the, the days and weeks and months of the year, and to be taken away from that at summer camp and focused on Christ. It is worthy, a worthy thing. So we hope you'll be involved with that. Matthew chapter 28, this morning we're continuing our series called Signs of a Biblical Church, and today we're talking about biblical evangelism. And I want to tell you about a, an adventure I went on, probably the most exciting adventure I've ever experienced in my life, because I almost lost my life on this adventure. Um, if, if I've told you about it before, please forgive me, because when you go on an adventure that exciting and you almost lose your life, you talk about it more than once. And I was actually whitewater rafting on the New River. And we were, uh, we were going down the New River, and we decided after we went through this certain uh, rapid, I think it was called Greyhound, we were going to surf it. Now, I know you surf at the beach, but I didn't know you could surf a river at that point. And what we did is we went through the rapid, we, we curved over into the eddy, which is the calm part of the river. Uh, rocks go through and it makes, you know, how the water's rushing here and then it's just calm right here. And so we got over there and we start rowing back toward the rapid, pretty big rapid. And I, I'm like, you know, has maybe our guide, has he lost his mind? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, usually you go down the rapids, not back up the rapids again. But we got to the rapid, and he said, now what we're going to do is we're going to hard forward into that rapid. And that is a, that is a recirculating hole. It's a hydraulic. It's the water's pouring over this rock, and it's creating this turbulent. And what it will do is it will grab our raft, and it will hold it there, and we will actually be able to just stop rowing and it will hold us in the middle of the river in this rapid and I was like wow that's pretty cool now the problem with that being pretty cool is I was at the point I was at the very front of the boat and so as soon as we he says hard forward and we plow into that rapid and as soon as we get into that rapid it grabs the front of our boat and pulls it down and guess who went right out the front me Next thing I know, I am under the raft. At least I think. I don't think the rocks are that rubbery. And I was wearing a hat that said, are we having fun yet? <laughs> the hat had literally floated to the surface. And my wife, who was in the boat, saw the hat, but she didn't see me. And she started to panic. And I was, this all happened in a matter of seconds. And I was underneath thinking, okay, this is it. I'm dying with catfish. I was ready to... I was ready to start sucking that new river water in. And, and I remembered in a split second a buddy of mine who was a raft, uh, a raft guide for years and years and years. His name was Brian Hager. We, we called him Squirrel because he could do an impression of a dying squirrel, but that's another story. Um, so, so he had told me, if you ever get caught in a hydraulic, ball up. Because what it will do is it gives less area for the water to grab and it will spit you out. And in that split second, I don't know how I thought about that. And I balled up and that thing spit me out of there. I was never so glad to see daylight and air. And they grabbed me and pulled me back into the boat. Now you say, you're thinking right now, if I ever go whitewater rafting, I will not sit in the front of the boat. But that's precisely what I am going to ask you to do this morning. In your life, especially your spiritual life, I'm asking you to get out of a safe seat and come to the front of the boat. Because there's great risk at the front of the boat. There's great adventure at the front of the boat. There's great reward at the front of the boat. Our passage of scripture is Matthew chapter 28. We know it is the Great Commission, and we'll get to it in just a moment. But I want to set this up by saying this is something, evangelism, that we believe in here at First Baptist Church. In fact, in our Constitution, in our Articles of Faith, in letter J, it talks about the church, the local church. And one of the statements in there is that we believe in the evangelization of the whole world. Now, First of all, we believe that in obedience to Christ's command to preach the gospel to the whole world, we believe that the Great Commission includes evangelism, that it includes Bible teaching, and that it includes the establishment of local churches. And we have scriptures to back that up, Matthew 28 that we're going to be in today, Acts 20, Romans 1, Romans 10. But unfortunately, Romans 28 and following 
is one of those scriptures that is familiar in our teaching, but it is forgotten in our practices quite often as individual believers. We believe the church should do it. We believe it should be in our documentation. But quite frankly, individually, are we doing it? Or are we just sitting in the back of the boat? Verse 16, look at it with me. It says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, a side note here, whenever Jesus is seen in Scripture going to the mountain, it's for a good reason. In fact, Jesus had six different mountaintop experiences. At one point, he went to the mountain to be tempted, but primarily to set Satan straight in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8, where Satan tempted him, and he said, for it is written, remember that passage. Another time he went to the mountain is he went to the uh, mountain at the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, not far from Capernaum, and there he taught the people. Many of you who have gone to the Holy Land, you've been to that that area there where it was another mountaintop experience for Jesus. He went to the mountain with Peter and James and John to pray in Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9, corresponding gospel accounts of that, and that's where he was transfigured into heaven. And in our text today, he went to the mountain of Galilee, and there he taught some again, and we're going to see that teaching in just a moment. But Jesus also went to a mountain called Golgotha, the place where he laid down his life for the sins of the whole world in Mark chapter 15 and verse 22. And one day, we who have trusted him as Lord and Savior will will see him standing on the heavenly Mount Zion in Jerusalem. In the nations, in, in Zechariah 14, we read about Revelation 14, 1. It describes how Jesus will return to the spot on, Mount, on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem in Israel, from which he ascended after the resurrection. When he steps down on that place for the second coming of Christ, he will split the earth from there to the Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate, literally, eternity. Well, one day after that will take place, we will go into eternity, future after the judgment of the nations and all that. We will have a new heaven, the Bible says, and a new earth. Isn't that exciting? A new heaven and a new earth. Listen, if you are all uptight about the fact that you can't get everything done in this life that you want to get done, don't sweat it. You got a new heaven and a new earth coming. If you think, man, I was wanting to do this when I was younger, now I'm older and I can't do it, don't sweat it. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. It's promised. In fact, uh, there's going to actually be a new new, um, partial or part-time class that's going to be in a couple of weeks where they're going to be teaching on heaven. And um, there's a couple of classes coming together uh, with it. They're going to be looking at that um, book on heaven. I believe Randy Alcorn wrote it. And by the way, if you'd be interested in, um, in getting in on that, it's good. not this week or next week. I think it's the week following. Uh, if you just drop by the Welcome Center, you don't have to put your name down. Just let us know that you're interested in it because we might have to find a bigger venue for it. But um, they're going to be going through that. But don't sweat those things because we have eternity future coming. So this is a very big deal here. I want you to look again at verses 17 through 20. The the disciples knew that this was a big deal. It says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I think that's true today, right? Some worship him and, and some still doubt him. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the earth, or the end of the age. And so there's our text. And, and right there in, those passage, in that passage of Scripture, we see the three main points. And I'm going to give them to you right now so you can write them down. You still have to fill in the other small lines there in your note, note page. But we see the power of Christ, we see the plan of Christ, and we see the presence of Christ. Now, I want to give you a takeaway today. And you can get that line filled in as well. Our primary response as Christ followers is to worship God. While our primary responsibility in that worship is to make disciples. Would you say that with me? Our primary response as Christ followers is to worship God. While our primary responsibility in that worship is to make disciples. So let's look at that. First in verse 19, we see the power of Christ. Now this is the, the part of the Great Commission that we often browse over. 
And we get to the but to get to the bottom line here, it says, Go, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Verse 19. So, so we must realize that everything Jesus is saying here is because of the fact that he has been given, it says in the text, look again, all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been given to him. In fact, Lord, the, Jesus is saying here that he is the Lord of everything. Everything. He's the Lord of our calendars. He's the Lord of your goals. He's the Lord of your body. He's the Lord of your very existence. And Jesus says, it's been given to me. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, two things at least. Number one, it means in your notes there, Jesus is Lord of us. Jesus is Lord of us. He is Lord of everything and everyone in this room. You say, well, but I'm not a believer. Well, it doesn't matter. Because your life is included in that everything. Everything includes you. And your life requires someone to have authority over it, its decisions, its responses, when it's going to end. And that authority has been given, he says to him. So who gave him the authority? Well, we see here from the passage of Scripture that we're reading that it came from the triune Godhead. Look at the text. Jesus gives us this official field pass from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, um, I got to go to a Marshall University football game a few weeks ago, and the person I went with was, gave me a field pass. Now, you can't go on Joan Edwards Field without a field pass. The Joan, I think they call it. Is that right? Or the Edward? The Joan? The Joan. I went on the Joan. I had a field pass. I got to walk down there, be near the, the, the actual football players and the band and everything that was happening down there. Well, well, here, you know, likewise, you, we have no right to go anywhere and proclaim the gospel without the field pass. Jesus is basically saying here, I'm giving you a field pass of all the earth. You have authority to go into the field of the world and share the gospel because I have the authority and I'm giving you the field pass. You see, we don't have any right to go around hurricane proclaiming the gospel without a pass to do it. But Jesus says, here it is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, here's your field pass. You know, Jesus is, speaks with authority here and points to the Trinity. We believe in the Trinity, God, one God, present and equal in three different distinct persons. And they have granted him all authority and he uses that authority to rightly send us forward with the gospel message. And that's why I find this kind of bewildering when I hear people make statements to me like this. They say, you know, I've decided to make Jesus Lord of my life. And a part of me rejoices, but a part of me thinks, you know, what's wrong with that statement? Because you really have no choice in the matter. You have no choice in the matter that Jesus is Lord of your life. Jesus is already Lord of every single one of our lives. Romans 14, 11 through 12. And, don't, and stay with me here because I'm going to explain what I mean. And that doesn't mean everybody's saved and going to heaven. But he's still Lord of everybody's life because listen to Romans 14, 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So the question is not, will we bow? The question is, when will we bow? We will either bow now or we will bow later, but everybody, he is Lord of everybody. It's just some people haven't acknowledged it yet. But the Bible is very clear about it. The most relevant question is not, is he Lord of our lives? He is already Lord of our lives. The most relevant question we have here is, have we submitted our lives to his lordship? Now, what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that we have surrendered every part of us to him. Have you done that? Think about your own life right now. Think about just you. Think about your pride. Think about your agendas. Think about your plans. Think about how you spend your money, how you spend your time. Think about the things you watch, the things you listen to. Think about all those things. Have you surrendered those to his lordship? You know, for me, it comes to the point where we say, you know, I don't call the shots anymore in my family. Christ calls the shots. 
I pray to him. I, I read and learn about him. I seek him in prayer and say, Lord, you guide me so I can guide others. Students, as you think about your future, where you're going to school, what you're going to study, what you're going to do with your life, that's exciting times. Listen, guys, the options are countless, but the object is singular. Did you hear that? I'm going to say it again. The options are countless, but the object is singular. You can choose many, many things to do with your life. And that's totally great. That's, that's, that's wonderful. You can choose many things to do with your life, and that's okay. But you must seek one thing, and that's the glory of God with your life. So how do we do that? Well, we surrender and we seek. We pray and we ponder and we proceed forward with one objective, to bring honor and glory to the Lord. Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatever you do in word or deed... Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So go for it. Go for it. But go for it for his glory. Great little book, Kevin DeYoung's Just Do Something, a liberating approach to finding God's will says this. Listen to this. The only claims God wants us to wear, or I'm sorry, the only chains God wants us to wear are the chains of righteousness, not the chains of hopeless subjectivism, not the shackles of risk-free living, not the fetters of horoscope decision-making, just the chains befitting a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Die to self, live for Christ, and then do what you want and go where you want for God's glory. I mean, end of quote, that, that says it really well there, I believe. There are thousands, countless options. You know, a lot of times we look at God's will and we say, oh no, it's just this one little thing. If I don't get this one little thing right, God's going to jump out from a a tree and say, aha, I caught you. You made the wrong decision. That's not our God. That's not what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that our main objective is to bring glory to God, but he gives countless opportunities to do that. Countless options to do that. Countless schools to go to. Countless jobs to have. There are lots of people in the world. Just because your boyfriend broke up with you, you don't have to go into depression. There are other fish in the sea. Amen. You know, we tend to take the great commission, the great things of God, and make them small. I mean, think about it. Even with the great commission, we try and stuff it into some kind of a singular church visitation program. But Jesus never did that. He said, all authority is mine. The gospel penetrates every area of your life. The food fair is his. So go there and witness. Your subdivision is his. Your school is his. West Virginia is his. This world is his. And he's given that authority to you. And he said, go and make disciples. The second thing we see is Jesus is Lord of the nations. Not only is he Lord of our lives, he's Lord of the nations. It says that all authority in heaven and earth is given to him. Now, I want you to leave Matthew 28, hold your place here, and I want you to take a left turn, go back in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, I want you to if you go to Ezekiel, you've gone too far, just come back one, one book. And I want you to see what Daniel had prophesied that pertains to Matthew 28, Daniel 7 and verse 13. Daniel 7 and verse 13. Daniel says this. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. So he's in human form. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Who's Daniel talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ here. He's talking that God gave the prophet the ability to look forward. And by the way, God sees everything, past, present, future, in the eternal present, now. And Daniel sees one who is going to come. At Daniel's time, he was looking forward. Notice he is going to have all authority. 
He has sovereign power and dominion over all nations. And it says there that they're going to worship him as Lord. And they're going to serve him. The word serve there is the Hebrew word pelak, which means to worship someone. Although yet in the future, Daniel saw the dominion of Jesus as complete. So hundreds of years before Matthew said it, Daniel saw it. And so Matthew 28 is prophetically proven. Now I want you to make a right turn, a hard right turn, and go all the way to the end of your Bible to the book of Revelation chapter 7. And look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9 and following. This is John taking, and, uh, taking a look and talking about what he sees in the future. And John says this, after this, he says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures... And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. John is looking in the future, and you know what he sees? Do you know who he sees? He sees you. He sees you. He sees me. He sees a vision here of of all these nations and every tongue and every nation standing before God. Every one of us will stand before God. Everyone hearing this, like I said before, it's not a matter, is he Lord over your life? He's Lord over your life. Have you acknowledged him as Lord over your life? Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. All of eternity, including you, my friend, is divinely funneling fast, very quickly towards this future event. No one will escape it. Look again, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every language will bow before the throne of God who was slain for sinners. Why? Because the Lamb, Jesus Christ, has defeated sin and death. That's why they're praising him as Lord of Lords and they're saying hallelujah, amen. So knowing the past and the future, Jesus is like, listen guys, because this has happened, because this is going to happen, go make disciples. Because everybody that doesn't become a disciple of Jesus Christ will be cast into eternal damnation, into hell. That's just the bottom line of it. And if you're here, my friend, and you haven't given your life over and he's the Lord of your life, you must do that. We will bow either now or then, but we will bow. Every one of us will bow before the Lord at one point. Now take a left turn and come back to our text in Matthew. Because as we see here, Daniel 7 stamps this as unquestionable. Revelation 7 stamps it as unavoidable. We all have an appointment with God to bow. You know, we are convinced in our hearts of this because we are convinced that the Bible clearly teaches That we who know Jesus Christ are all sinners saved by grace who have just recognized that we have transgressed God's holiness. God is a holy God. You see, we don't get saved because it's going to make our life better. Because quite frankly, I could could have person after person in this room stand up and give a testimony to you right now about when they got saved, life didn't get better. Life did better, but their eternity was settled. No, the reason we get saved is because we recognize that our sin has transgressed God's holiness. We have broken God's perfect law. We've proven it again and again and again. But Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood to pay for your sins. Listen to me. You were unrighteous. Here's a picture of you over here. You're unrighteous. You're in this filthy, 
mud-stained, oil-stained, whatever stained, blood-stained robe. And here's Jesus over here in this pure, white, perfectly holy garment called righteousness. You are clothed in unrighteousness. And Jesus Christ came to this earth and he came and willingly died on the cross for your sins. He paid for your sins and then he got down off of that cross. He, he was in the grave three days and defeated sin and death. And what he did is when you came to him, when you said, Jesus, I recognize what you did, Jesus. I, there was a day for me I did that. I said, Jesus, I recognize what you did for me. And I admitted to you, look at me. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a sinner. I'm in unrighteousness. I'm clothed in unrighteousness. Listen, until you realize that you are depraved to the core and a sinner who's in need of salvation and you can't save yourself until you look to the cross and say, Jesus, look at me. I can't do anything about this. Look at me. And Jesus says, I am looking at you. I looked at you when I hung on that cross. That's why I hung on that cross. Because I was looking at you. And I say to him, Jesus, I fall on my face before you. I can't save myself. Will you save me? Will you become the Lord of my life? And Jesus says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he comes down off of that cross and he comes and he takes his robe off and he put, takes your dirty garment off and he casts it away ever to be gone as far as the east is from the west. And he puts that white robe on you and he clothes you in righteousness. Not righteousness of your own, but in his righteousness. That's the picture of salvation. That's why he says, look, because of all this, go, go and make disciples. Plead with them. This is the call of the passage. Now, I want you to notice next here, the plan of Christ. We've seen the power of Christ. Now, look at verse um, in, in back in our chapter, when Jesus begins to speak, he says, go therefore, Matthew 28, we see the plan of Christ. He says, go therefore, in light of all of this, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, I want to give you a little grammar lesson here, a little, little um, Greek grammar lesson. Because in this entire passage, there is only one imperative verb. An imperative verb is what? It's a command, right? There's only one. We read this and we think, well, the imperative verb is go. But it's not. Go is a, it's just a participle. A, a participle, there are other ones there like baptizing and teaching. And these participles basically point toward the imperative. So going and baptizing and teaching are participles pointing toward one imperative. What is the imperative? The imperative is this, make disciples of all nations. That's the imperative. That's the command that comes from this passage. Granted, in order to make disciples, you have to go, you have to baptize, and you have to make, you have to make disciples, you have to teach them. But the main command is to make disciples. You have one imperative mission in your life, friend. Listen to me. One imperative mission in your life. It's not to make money. It's not to be successful. It's not to live nice and retire well. That's not your objective. Your objective, one objective is, is not, and those things aren't bad, by the way, to do those things. They're not, but they're not imperative. They're not the one thing. They, one thing is to make disciples of all nations. Now, please understand here another thing. This is so important. Because this is an imperative, that means it's a command, right? Listen, here's the mistake so many people make. And this is why evangelism is so lacking in the local church today. Because we don't see this as an imperative. We don't see this as a command. We see this as a calling. This is not a calling. This is a command. It's not a calling. It's a command. Uh, salvation is a calling. 
A salvation that the Lord makes you alive and he calls you under salvation and you see Jesus Christ as your savior. But once you receive that calling under salvation, then you get a command. And that command is very simply, go and make disciples. Now granted, it looks differently for, for all of us because we all have different gifts, different talents, different passions, different personalities. And so from this command, we have different specific callings in our life. Your calling isn't the same as my calling. I've been honored and blessed to be called into the vocational calling of this, of, and this command of going and making disciples. So some are commanded, and they use it through their construction job. Some are teachers. Some are nurses. Some people stay at home. Some people move abroad. To other nations but the one command for all of us is this make disciples wherever you are however you're wired whatever your passion is use that whatever you make whatever gifts you have whatever treasure you have use that for the kingdom use that for eternity not just to be comfortable now because it's not a calling it's a command so what's the problem We've turned the command into a call. We've reversed it to fit our agendas. And we say things like, you know what? I'm not called to make disciples. That's the missionary's job or that's the pastor's job. Well, you're right. It's not a calling. It's a command. We are commanded to make disciples, every single one of us, no exceptions. We've, if we placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are commanded to go. We should be compelling them to come to Christ. You know, one of the things you can do, I mean, we have, we have young couples in this church, especially, you know, in, we have them in both, service, both services. We have young couples, young families here. And you know other young couples and other young families out there who are just kind of lost right now. They're just kind of like out there treading water. And you've seen, God has opened your eyes, you've seen the benefit of having your family in church and, and letting your kids learn about Christ and all these things. G challenge them. Hey, hey, I've got a life strategy for you. We've taken this life strategy on ourselves for, for months or years now. We see some great benefit in it. Share those benefits with it and what, what it's done for you. And then compel them. Say, hey, come with us. Sit with us. Walk with us. That's not, Jesus didn't just say, be comfortable and sit back. He didn't say, hey, go and just reach a bunch of people for Jesus Christ, put a notch in your belt and say, hey, I got another one saved. Uh, there used to be a publication that was out. Uh, it was a Christian publication, and they would post every month all of their statistics of how many people got saved at all their evangelistic meetings. And I understand that. It, it, praise the Lord for people coming to Christ. But I always had this pressing question in my heart, what are they doing with them now? Because Jesus didn't say, just get them saved. Look what he says. He said, make what? Disciples. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like having a newborn baby. We've had lots of newborn babies around the church here uh, born, and I don't know of a single parent who had that newborn baby, and, and the baby was born, and they just said, hey, good, look, good, good luck with that, with that development thing, baby. You're on your own now. Not a single one of them did that. They took that child, and they're developing. They're teaching them to eat, teaching them to walk, teaching them to potty. <laughs> I don't know how that fits in there, but... It does, some way. Do you know when you truly have made a disciple? When they go make a disciple. When you reach somebody for Christ, when you disciple them, and then they go and make a disciple, you've made a disciple. You know, but Jesus doesn't stop there. Look again. He says, baptizing them. Again, why? Why? Because baptism helps people establish their faith publicly. We've had, we have a lot of people in our church who have businesses. And not a single one of those people started a business and then didn't hang a sign out, didn't advertise. None of them did that. They all did. You proclaim it 
Listen, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and never been baptized, I want to encourage you to take a step to publicly identify with Christ and with his church. Hang out that salvation shingle. In, um, in a children's book that I wrote called God is Really, Really Real, 30 Easily Taught Bible Doctrines, we declare that, bi- that baptism is a public picture of our salvation. And then we reference Acts 2 and verse 41, which says, so those who received the word were baptized. And then with this explanation, quote, baptism is an outward picture of an inward decision that a person has already made in their heart to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Baptism does not save you, but is a public demonstration of our commitment to Jesus Christ and is a beautiful picture of our salvation. When we are baptized, we identify ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, knowing you have the presence of Christ in your life, what do you do? You change your seat in the boat and you share your faith. But the last thing is this, and we're done, is you don't just reach them, you teach them. Look again, Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we teach them how to study God's word. We teach them how to pray. We teach them how to share their faith with other people. So what's the best method for doing that? Is it simply handing them over to the pastor, handing them over to the Sunday school teacher and saying, you, you teach them how to, to pray, you teach them how to study God's word, you teach them how to share their faith? Or do we as believers is the best thing for us to take them with us, to show them how we study our Bible, to study our Bibles together, to, to pray with them and let them hear us praying and show talk to them about prayer, to help them share their faith, to take them with us and show them how we share our faith. Is that the best method? I think maybe that's the best method. But we have a problem, don't we, there? And we all know that problem. Because if we're honest, we don't often do those things. We count on the professionals to do that. We, we subcontract that out. But according to the text, Jesus says you can't subcontract that out. You are the contractor. He says, go and make disciples. I have a friend, Mike Lake, who is a dynamic national leadership development and church planting expert from Pratt, West Virginia. He he lives in Atlanta now, and he heads up church planting efforts for the entire SBC. He talks about three levels of leadership conversion. Level one is do. Do. Your mentor answers all of your questions. And this is you. You're the mentor. This is how you disciple. You you answer all of their questions. Question after question after question after question. You answer them. Level two, you lead them. Level one, you what? do level two you you lead them what does that mean your mentor asks you to give input into the process you know how would you do this what do you think about this and they're asking you questions so the first level is what do second level level is lead and the last level is develop develop your mentor challenges you to go and do it to someone else so you do it for them You lead them as they are doing it, and then you send them to develop and do it themselves. The Great Commission doesn't stop at conversion. It continues through discipleship. The last thing Jesus says, and we're done, look, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, why does he say that? Well, the Bible teaches that God will never leave us or forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. This isn't about the presence of his being. This is about the presence of his power in your life. You want to witness the manifestation of God's power, then lead someone to faith in Christ and disciple them. You will witness the power of God. Go to God in prayer and sincerely say to him, God, I'm giving you a blank check with my life. 
You say, Pastor, I'm at the end of my account. (laughs) I'm at the end of my life. Lord, what's left in my account? I'm giving it to you. Use my life. And I'm not talking about financial account. I'm talking about your time here left on this earth. Say, God, it's yours. Now, I want to go and make disciples in the time that I have left. If all of us are doing that, this room can't hold it. This room won't be able to hold the disciples that Jesus Christ will be bringing. This church won't be able to hold the disciples if we are all serious about this great commission. Would you pray with me? The challenge is this. I believe that all of us here who know Christ as our Lord and Savior are in the boat. We are in the boat. But a lot of us are in a safe seat. And God is backing backing us to get out of our seat and come to the front of the boat and experience, literally drink in all of the river of your existence with Christ. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you to come to him today in prayer, confessing your sins, asking him to forgive you of your sins, and he'll save your soul. He'll give you eternal life. He'll come down from that. He's come down from the cross. He will come and take your unrighteousness away and clothe you in his righteousness. But you have to go to him and ask him by faith. If you're a believer and you've trusted in Christ and you say, Pastor, this morning... God's convicted me about my need to share my faith, about my need to tell others about Christ, about my need to make disciples. And pray for me in this closing prayer that I will be able to do that. Anyone like that, would you just lift your hand and say, hey, that's me. I just remember me in this prayer. Praise the Lord. I want to share my faith. I want to share my faith. Anybody? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Oh, Father, Lord, I pray, God, that you will empower these who have acknowledged their desire to make disciples. And, Lord, I pray that you will compel others who aren't quite there to remember from whence they were rescued. to remember that hour they first believed, to remember that you have forgiven them and that without your forgiveness, others will perish eternally in hell and that they will be compelled to go and share the gospel and make disciples and invite people to walk this faith walk with them for your glory. Oh God, we ask this in your glorious name. Amen. If you have any thing that you want to talk with us about, baptism, salvation, whatever it is, um, Pastor Ron will be right up here at the end for just a little bit. And he'll be making his way back to a class. I'll be at the Welcome Center. Would love to talk with you.
Bow with me for a closing prayer. Our Father, we can bring hallelujah before you in music. We can bring it before you to praise your name with our voices. And one of the greatest ways for us to bring praise to you is to make disciples. God, make us disciples who make disciples who make disciples and pass it on generation to generation for as long as you let this world exist. Let us be your disciples and make us bold to share the faith, the faith that saves, the faith that gives eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.